I celebrated, you know, I had a dinner, I think my husband and I went out to dinner when my book was done and I'm doing air quotes. Yeah, it was finished, right? I And then the, the words book proposal came into my life. <laughs> and I just, I'm offended. I was like, what? Somebody just doesn't want to like, swoop in and buy this golden baby that I just produced. You know, it's, they don't just trust that it's, it's really good. My voice is really strong. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 188 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have a fascinating conversation with Denise Masser. She is the author of a memoir that currently titled Matched. We talk about adoption. We talk about the process of finding an agent. We talk about the process of being on submission, especially during pandemic times, and so much about the business of publishing. Of course, Denise and I also get into some very personal adoption-related stories. Like, we really, really uh, clicked. I'm so glad uh, that our mutual friend Julie Strauss introduced us. But that's coming up later in this episode. Before I get to that, let's first hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Find Away Voices. Find Away Voices is a platform that allows you to get your audiobook out into the global market of more than 40 retail and library markets. Find Away Voices also allows you to control your price at pretty much 99% of those markets, and uh, including the library price and retail price. If you are looking for a narrator to work with, a professional, and you're not sure who to find, you can use Find Away Voices to find a narrator, or if you already have your files ready to go, you can just use Find Away Voices to distribute. There's plenty of choices, plenty of options. You're working with professionals who have been part of the greater Findaway team who have been doing audiobooks and working with major publishers for audiobooks for way longer than Findaway Voices came around. Findaway Voices is basically an arm of the greater Findaway company that was created just for uh, providing a solution for independent authors to get their works out into a global market. Now, because Find Away Voices is partnered with BookBub to create the audiobook form Chirp, it's kind of the only way you can get your audiobook into Chirp is being published through Find Away Voices. And with Chirp, you can get into some promotion opportunities. There's other promo opportunities available through Apple Books, for example, for your audiobook. So lots of opportunity, lots of choice, lots of decisions you can make. And if you're looking at how you can leverage Find Away Voices as an independent author. Check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. I'd like to thank people for the comments that they've left uh, over on starkreflections.ca as well as through Twitter. So uh, there's too many to mention because I've waited so many weeks to actually comment on them. So thank you so much to uh, Edwin Downward, uh, the indie author, uh, Roland Denzel, Regina Clark, Caitlin Duncan, Indie Author Tools, Online for Authors, Joanna Penn, and so many more of you for tweeting images of or thoughts related to Wide for the Win. And so many similar posts were made on Facebook and in the Wide for the Win group on Facebook. Thank you so much. And speaking of which, there was also on uh, Twitter and in Facebook plenty of love and sharing for a recent appearance that I had on the Creative Pen podcast with Joanna Penn. And one of the most recent ones I saw that I really loved um, was from Talina Winters, who was previously a guest on this podcast. Uh, she shared a sticky note uh, she had written down, where in my interview with Joanna, Talina wrote down this quote from me. You only hear the success stories of the people who didn't give up. So, Talina, thank you for sharing that. And you, dear listener, if you're hearing that, just remember, you do only hear the success stories of the people who did not 
give up. That's me blatantly telling you to not give up, to stick it out, to be there for the long run. In terms of other comments, Amy Tassacata said about episode 187, which was business-minded creative marketing with Diana Wink. Uh, another interesting interview. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm glad you found that inspirational. Yeah, I'm, I'm still inspired by Diana. And I just, when I was, uh, I was corresponding with uh, a writer this week, and I actually uh, referred back to Diana talking about marketing and storytelling and and the way that she makes that connection and reminds us that marketing isn't some foreign weird icky concept it's really proper storytelling for the right audience and that really really is a game changer so uh thank you amy i'm glad uh, you found that uh in i'm glad you found that conversation with diana inspirational and on episode 185 promotions results and analysis chad boyer said Mark, I really like these posts. It's good to know how the full breakdown of a release and promotion cycle works. I'm curious what the read-through is going to be and overall success of the promotion. I do have a question in how did you coordinate this? Was it just a lot of Excel sheets and calendar marking? Or do you have a checklist when you release new books? As always, thanks for the wisdom, and I am looking forward to sharing a beer with you once the borders open up again. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Yes, definitely looking forward to that beer. Um... Okay, so um, uh, yeah, the the read through. I, I'll I'll probably share in a future episode how things are continuing uh, to go uh, with that series. I, I'm guessing on read through, of course. But so, how did I coordinate this? Great question, Chad. Um, there there was a bit of an Excel uh, document for that. Now, no, I don't actually have a checklist when I release new books, and I'm horrible at, at properly doing this. Like you know, sending out art copies and 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 stuff like that. It's kind of haphazard. And I'm a disorganized mess. But but for the promo that I was talking about, there's a giant whiteboard on the wall in front of me that I can see right now. And I just cleared it off because I, I kept it on the whiteboard because I was using it in that uh, episode. And and I jotted down the, the dates and the, the platform uh, that I was submitting to. And I sort of jotted it down. And then when I got the acceptance um, for that, uh, then I put a check mark beside it. But I also left the ones I didn't get. Uh, with no check mark, uh, and I sort of like lightly just crossed them out, meaning I knew I had applied for it, but I didn't get it, and so which is often what happens with a book bub, and so I had that, but I also had a, a little uh, printed calendar on um, on my desk, which is uh, in front of my laptop. I'm just looking to my left where I can see it, and what I did is I marked down the date of the start of the promo when I dropped Canadian Werewolf down to ninety nine cents. And when I brought it back up to full price. So so when I was looking at the different sites, I could visually have in front of me without having to toggle to another screen. I could kind of see the, the beginning date and end date. Now, that price change I scheduled ahead of time through draft to digital because you can do that. So that would have been for Nook and um, uh, Apple and, and some of the other platforms. With Kobo Writing Life, I could schedule it in advance. Right, You set the start and end date as well. With Google Play, you can schedule it in advance. And then the only one where you can't schedule it in advance and you have to do it manually is Amazon. So I have to usually put a, a note in my calendar to say, okay, on this date, I'm going to change it. And on this date, I need to change it back. And so that uh, if it wasn't for Amazon, you can kind of set it and forget it. Well, not forget it, but you can kind of set it way ahead of time with all the other platforms, which is really, really cool. So that's kind of how I did it, Chad, is I kind of, uh, you know, I used the whiteboard, I used the calendar and, and sort of a combination. And then I did, uh, you know, export some of the data and the sales data into Excel. So thanks for asking that. I hope you found that uh, useful. And yes, as mentioned, I'm looking forward to having a beer in person once the borders open up and the pandemic starts to subside. In terms of a personal update, here are just some of the recent appearances that I have been on in the last little while. So on April 17th, 2021, I was on Sci-Fi Saturday Night TalkCast 478. And uh, the episode was called Their Wolf, which is kind of a, a reference to an old humor movie. Um, and it was an interview about fear and longing in Los Angeles. Fantastic interview. I had a really great time with that. 
And in the day before, uh, April 16th, uh, at 9 p.m. Pacific, um, I was on uh, KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 1050 AM Palm Springs on the House of Mystery radio show. Another great conversation about fear and longing in Los Angeles. So there's just some great uh, media uh, appearances, which are, were a lot of fun. Uh, both of them booked by my uh, publicist, uh, Mickey, uh, who was on a previous episode uh, of this podcast of, of uh, Creative Edge Publicity. And um, uh, speaking to Mickey, he also got me on April 10th, 2021, there was a review, an audio review of Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, Stowaway, and a Canadian werewolf in New York. And this was on the Stuff File program, episode number 608. And uh, it was in the book banter segment with uh, Stuart Nauman. And Stuart Nauman also uh, posted uh, a review, that review, in uh, the Montreal Times, uh, which was pretty exciting. So thanks to my publicist, Mickey, for getting me those appearances. And and again, it's really difficult when you get media appearances like that to attribute sales to them. But, you know, you do what you can. Uh, you, you get word of mouth out there as much as possible. And hopefully the right people uh, pick up your book. Uh, in other personal update news, I was I was thrilled to see Stark Reflections podcast listed in spot number nine on Feedspot's top 35 Canadian book podcast. Pos- po- I can't speak. I'll try that again. On Feedspot's top 35 Canadian book podcasts, you must follow in 2021. Now, it's listed alongside some pretty amazing bookish podcasts like uh, CBC Canada Reads podcast, Writers Trust of Canada podcast. So many amazing podcasts, and I just felt honored that I got to be included in that. And there'll be a link to that in uh, the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. And uh, it is the 22nd of April when I'm recording this. And on the 20th of April, I got my uh, first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. I got the AstraZeneca and uh, they'd opened up on, uh, on I guess it was the 20th, to in the province of Ontario. They'd open it up to anyone ages 40 up. And so I immediately put myself on a couple wait lists. And then I saw a friend of mine, Dean, he had uh, just, it was a picture, he'd gotten a vaccine at uh, Shoppers Drug Mart at Conestoga Mall here in Waterloo. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> so I immediately, uh, I immediately jumped in the car and rushed down there. And I remember Liz, I didn't even let Liz know she was just on her way home from work. And I just took off uh, just to rush there. And she was texting me while I was in line saying, um, where did you disappear to? And I was letting her know that I was uh, in line. So it didn't take very long, probably within an hour, I had my vaccine. I was back home and feeling great. Uh, of course, about six or seven hours later is when it hit me. Uh, the side effects, the chills, the aching, uh, the, the achy uh, bone, the fever, um, and uh, and the tiredness. And, and, and I had a pretty uh, restless uh, night of sleep, like fevery, sweaty. Uh, the next day, yesterday, the 21st, uh, I was out of it. I slept in, I ended up having a three hour nap in the afternoon and I was barely, I had a few meetings in the morning. I had to cancel meetings in the afternoon. I couldn't even, I could barely stand. Now today I'm, I'm, I'm back. Uh, I'm feeling like a thousand times better. I'm still feeling a little bit achy, a little bit of headache, a little bit of, you know, chills and, uh, but way, way better. And, and I, I think, okay, the side effects of the, the vaccination are, are far, far better. Uh, than the side effects of of COVID. So I'm not slated to get dose two until August, um, but the vaccine I have is 76% effective with dose one. And then after you get dose two, it's 82% or 84% effective. So it was like, it's not all that much difference. So, you know, in another week and and, uh, and a bit, it's like a two week period, I'll uh, kind of feel like I've got... um, I've got a bit more defense uh, against the uh, the dark arts, <laughs> defense against the global uh, pandemic, and so looking forward to hugging people again and going out in public and 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 all doing all the things uh, that we haven't been able to do in in a significant amount of time. But that is it for the opening and my introduction and my personal updates. Why don't we get right into this interview with Denise? Denise, thank you so much for coming on to my podcast. Thank you for having me. I am so thrilled to talk a little bit about uh, your book and some of the things that you've been doing 
uh, to get it published. But first, I want to go back to your memoir and what it's about, because uh, I want my our listeners to understand. I've, I've had the privilege of, of listening to you on some other podcasts and mm-hmm. reading some articles. So I know, but my listeners don't know what your memoir is about. Okay, well, um, my memoir is titled Matched, but since we're all writers here, I will freely and gladly admit that my agent wants to do a title change. So it might not be called Matched forever, but right now it's called Matched. Oh, cool. We can talk about that in a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm well, curious, yeah. It's Doesn't interesting, it yeah. Let's, let's talk about it. Um, and basically what it's about is my a husband and I wanted to adopt a baby. Okay. And... I went into it thinking that I knew everything about adoption because I'm adopted. So like I've always thought of myself as an expert and, you know, really prided myself on that. And once we started getting into the process of um, private domestic newborn adoption here in the U S I was just floored to realize that I basically knew nothing (laughs) about modern adoption. And uh, the way that I had been adopted was, you know, my parents put their name on a list and then when it was their time, it was their time and they were handed a baby and how it is today is it's um, it's a very competitive thing to adopt a newborn infant. For every uh, newborn adoptable baby in the U.S., there are 80 couples or singles vying for that one baby. Oh, this is for newborn. For yeah. newborns. Yeah, for newborns. Wow. And then also, um, you know, there when I was adopted back in 72, Um, You know, there was absolutely no connection between the birth mom and the adoptive parents. It was just all very closed and secretive and and very intentionally that way. Same thing in 1969. Yeah, see? (laughs) Here in Canada. (laughs) Yes, yes. We have so much to talk about, Mark. Um, And, but how it's done today is unless you go through an agency, you know, we didn't, about half people do, half the people don't. We just went through um, an attorney you are basically out there stumping for yourself. Like you're advertising for yourself. You are trying to, you are tasked 100% with finding your own birth mom. And so- So hang on, I have to, so uh, I have to- Yeah, yeah, no. (laughs) I'm just so fascinated by this. So it's kind of like you're you're advertising because you're looking for somebody who is having a baby or wants to have a baby. It's not a surrogate, right? It's like they're, they're having a baby, but they're not able to keep the baby. And you're saying, hey, we're- we're good parents. We were loving parents. We'll take the child. That's is it yes. that kind of thing. You are you are searching for a woman who is pregnant and does not want to keep her baby. Has already made that decision. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I knew I had to write a book because over the process, over the six months that we were searching for a birth mom, um, I came into contact with nine different women young, super young, older, everything from, you know, homeless women to one woman had her master's degree and was a high level executive and just was divorcing her husband, didn't want anything to do with another child with him. So each one of these women was so unique. Um, One woman, the first woman to contest, contact us actually had been raped twice. Um, And she wasn't even sure whose baby it was, but she just didn't want anything to do with it. Right. Um, and then other women, you know, I think there was a, a woman in there who actually, well, I know there was, who was not pregnant and, you know, just, I don't want to feed into that scamming notion of birth moms. Cause it's really not that prevalent, but it did happen to us. Wow. Um, it, it was just, it was just an amazing story to go through in, in six months to, wow. to so learn about those nine women. Different women in six months that you were interacting with. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, I mean, you're just, the, the part that struck me is just so different from how I understood adoption was, I mean, the things that you do to find a woman in crisis, it feels seedy. It feels scummy sometimes. Like, right. you know, you, you do go to homeless shelters. Um, a woman reached out, had heard about us through either Facebook or Craigslist, all these places I placed ads. Wow. And a woman reached out from um, a shelter here in Orange County where she took in women who'd been in sex trafficking rings. Okay. And she was like, hey, I think it'd be really good for us to have your name, you know, just in case a baby, you know, somebody comes in that's pregnant. Wow. So it just 
really, there's really, I had a lot of compassion and sympathy for these birth mother figures that we kind of in society just think of as like, um, you know, maybe a 16 year old that got pregnant on spring break or, yeah, you know, yeah. oh, in her gap year and, and she's going to Yale. That ain't it. And these women are struggling and, wow. and they all have stories. See, what I find so fascinating is the juxtaposition of, you said it's felt seedy and scammy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of it is love. Yes. From the mother and from the adoptive parents, right? It's all about love, wanting to love, wanting uh, a child to be cared for and loved, but being unable to for emotional reasons, personal, like all kinds of uh, reasons. Um, yes. And, and in the midst of all that, you're feeling like you're, you know, snooping, you know, homeless shelters and, 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 and women's shelters and all kinds of, wow, that, that's, that's got to be the, the play on emotions must be so difficult, devastating. Yes, it, it wow. definitely is. And then it, and it's the same for birth moms, I think. I mean, they are, um, on one side, they are told that what they're doing is coming from a place of love, you know, just exactly as you described. That's exactly how I would describe it. Um, but then there are other people out there who are really anti-adoption right. um, and would say, you know, that a real woman wouldn't give up her child right. or right. you'll find a way. So, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting that it can be viewed adoption. And I didn't know this until after I'd adopted as well. Adoption is a hot button topic. It, there are people who are very against it. Um, and well, even wait a the, second, I, I, as yeah. hot that a topic as abortion? Yes. Really? Yes. And wrapped up in abortion, actually, because a lot of people are surprised um, that I am adopted, but also pro-choice. They say like, how could that possibly be? And I'm like, I actually don't even get the connection. Like, yeah, 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 uh, you know, yeah. but a lot of people think have said, you know, and this is not in my face, but like on um, Twitter and stuff, well, you could have been aborted, you, but you know, you're lucky you weren't. So that's where that tie-in comes in. But yeah, pe I mean, it's definitely a hot button. Yeah. Wow. That's fast. And so I think what's fascinating is not only as an adoptive mother, um, you have that perspective, but having been adopted, uh, yes. you also have that perspective. Is it okay if we go back and look at you being adopted? Like the, the, the house, yes. so you said it was closed where you didn't know, and you know, the state or whatever keeps everything locked and they make up, they do make up stuff <laughs> to yeah. try and hide. Uh, whereas you're, you're doing this open adoption. Uh, did you ever, uh, did you ever connect? Uh, did you ever find out who your birth parents were or your birth mother was or any of that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially how Match actually became a book in my mind. And that is the last third of it is after adopting Henry and going through the process um, and just, just realizing that adoption could be so much more open than mine was. I mean, it sounds like yours was similar to mine and everything was just secret and closed and sealed and, you know, classified. <laughs> but with Henry, you know, he, he, his birth mom and I have pictures together in the hospital and, you know, we exchange pictures and phone numbers and addresses and wow. he'll always be able to talk to her anytime he wants to. That is so wonderful. So when I saw that it could be like that, I kind of had an awakening, you know, at that time I was 45 and for any other 45 year old women out there listening, you know, that is an awakening time where you start digging into some shit. And so I just thought it doesn't have to be this way. You know, I, I've always wondered, did anybody else have red hair or freckles or was left-handed or am I, and you know this Mark, am I likely candidate for breast cancer, cancer, heart? I don't know any of that. It's right. not fair. I want to know those things. So and this was, I, I'm not a big like magical thinker, but um, the summer after we adopted Henry and I, I did my very first like kind of dip my toe in the water of finding out my adoption record, learning about it in Washington State. Washington State had just that summer passed legislation um, that opened up adoption records. 
So I was able to um, find, get my adoption records and read everything about my adoption. But actually, hold on, I fast forwarded too much. How I actually found my birth mom yeah. was I just requested my birth certificate uh, because those records had opened up in Washington State. And then I threw her name into Facebook and there she was. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so this was uh, not not that long. Not that it long. Was, well, Facebook um, was what ten years old. <laughs> uh, it was. This all happened probably five years ago. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, it was funny. I, I had a similar story where um, we, we were. Um, uh, I had just been married, and before having children, I didn't know anything about my medical history, and I was worried I might pass something on because right. I have epilepsy, and I thought, well, okay. Is it heredity? And because the doctors are like this, does it run in the family? Well, we don't know, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I did the same thing. Now the internet was young. <laughs> it took me about 15 minutes. I just went like, oh, oh, wow. I think I found, oh, wow. Okay, again, like you, it was Wait, like- Did you know, did you find your one either your birth mom or birth dad? Uh, they ended up getting married. Uh, I have a full sister, six other siblings. Yeah, no, no, I, I got to meet them. Um, wow. which is amazing, uh, it really, uh, really cool. But it was kind of like, I thought I was prepared for, it's going to take me 10 years. It's gonna, right. right. I'm going to have to hire a private investigator. Right. I thought that too. I thought that too. Yeah. yeah. And then I had to send a check for $15 to get my birth certificate. And that was it. Oh, wow. Was See, like, I didn't even have to. I just, uh, on AOL, because that was like the only AOL! Thing I And I eat, because th there was no real internet. It was just text-based back then, right? And then right. I... <laughs> Uh, I, I emailed the guy and I said, well, I found this record. I think that's me. And he emailed back and I confirmed a few details and he goes, but yeah, I think we got you. And then within a week I was emailing my uh, sister. That's amazing. Uh, so yeah, it was a really cool, like, again, like you, it was like, I was expecting this to take longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I write in match. Like it was, it was like thinking that you had to climb Mount Everest and then there's actually just a door to the left. You just kind of walk through <laughs> Escalator. It. <laughs> it was like, whoa, yes. we lucked out, didn't we? <laughs> yes, we did. We did, because a lot of people don't. Yes. So, okay. So, so Matched is about your experience adopting Henry. And how old is Henry now? He's a seven-year-old first grader. Ooh, oh, boy. Not a great time to be in school, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or in school and out of school and in school and out of school. Yes. Um, but uh, so seven years, seven years old. And, yeah. uh, and so you started writing this book. So shortly after you adopted Henry was when you did, you dropped your mom's name in <laughs> Facebook and found her. How did yes. that go? Yes. Um, you mean, how did it go when I like found her? Yeah. I like was the experience. So you found her, you reached out. I, we haven't talked about that at all. No. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was, it was lovely. It was all I could have asked for. I, I sent her um, a Facebook message and, you know, we're writers. So I, I just, it was like, Hey, I don't want anything. I don't need, I just really wanted to wonder if you are, you know, right. that were, did you have a baby on July 11th, you know, 1972? I think I've, I'm wondering, uh, you know, I have a family, I'm a mom myself. And then she just wrote back and I will never forget it. She, messaged me back and the first uh line of the message was yes i am your mother you know just blows you away um yeah. as an adoptee and i do have to say um i i don't call gwen my birth mom my mom my mom is my mom and i'm very sentimental about that because i recently lost her but um yeah my i mean it, finding my birth mom was amazingly easy and then we set up a time and a place to meet after we'd emailed for about a year right right and um kind of another kismet thing where i was like no way is um she was from the we, you know we're both from the pacific northwest obviously and you know i'm all writerly and bookish and she just sh out of nowhere said why don't we meet um at the coffee shop and pals books for the first time and you're like heaven <laughs> coffee and books are you kidding me <laughs> we are definitely biologically related <laughs> yeah so then we met and then it was really kind of 
I mean, it was an amazing moment for me to, to meet my birth mom. And then also, um, you know, my husband was great and he kept the kids for a while so we could meet and, you know, kind of vibe in palace books. And then to have my, hu my husband, um, ex-husband now, but walk in with my kids and see Henry, my adopted son, interact with my birth mom. Oh my God. You know, just wow. so <laughs> full circle and really overwhelming and wonderful. That's amazing. It's funny that you said uh, that you call your mom, your mom. Yeah. And your birth mom, your birth mom, because that's exactly how, it's exactly how uh, I felt uh, or, and feel uh, the same yeah. way. Nothing against my birth mother. She's a beautiful, no. wonderful woman, amazing woman, actually. Uh, yes. who's been through so much and such a strong person but my mom's my mom yes right so like yeah it's I have the same it's, it's kind of an interesting that I think we have a very similar uh approach to that it's kind of like um it's the old thing I used to say about ebooks when people are like well the the, the ebooks here it's gonna it's the death of the print book I'm like no no no, the book didn't die you just had babies right it's just another there's you can yes. it, everything is with instead of not, not instead of right it's like it's inclusive it's all good yes yes <laughs> and absolutely. i guess some people may may not uh may not be able to see that they may feel um uh, threatened right that yeah i'm going to be replaced or any of those things and I, and I imagine that you you've had a relationship with henry's birth mother yes right? and, and and an open relationship and so that potentially that threat does not go away well, or, or the threat is not as like, there's not, it's not this mysterious. It like does that. go away. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I, I know who she is as a woman. I think the big, okay. So I was just going to say my mom um, actually was threatened um, by the, by my finding Gwen and she didn't even want to talk about it very much. I've never, I don't think I ever did explain to her adequately because she just didn't even want to talk about it. Right. But I do write about it in Matched um, where I just say, you're my mom, my mommy, my mama, you're all of it. You are everything. And being a mother and you have kids, you know, so being a father, I know that like being a mom is, you know, cleaning up the puke at 2 30 a.m right being a mom is knowing who they had a crush on in the fourth grade but didn't tell anybody else um it's it, all these things and so gwen could never be my mom but my mom was not ready to hear that she just the whole thing was very threatening to her and then me on the other hand since i know henry's biological mom I know her as a woman with faults and strengths, and she's like a decade younger than I am at least, which is, that should be threatening, right? She's, yeah. That's what I, I told Henry. She's always going to be younger than me. She's always going to be cooler than me. Yeah. You know, I get all that. She's going to know not, how to use the new technology. <laughs> right. She won't use the old people emojis. Um, but I think it's like any, it's like anything. The thing you know, you can deal with. But the way they did our adoptions, where these birth moms were these secret women, our our adoptive moms probably built them up in a way that just wasn't even realistic, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is so. It's it's funny. The parallels between us are just so so I know. consistent. We need to talk more offline. Uh, I know we really need to do because my my, my mom is is still not at all comfortable. Doesn't want to talk about it. Doesn't even want to think about it. Before my dad died he was so supportive and wanted to get to know everyone and wanted to be involved and and wanted to hang out with my uh, ha half brother um, who, who was also a fisherman like him and and, mm. and like he was just in and then actually when he died he was kind of like the voice of you know no this is this is good this is this is a cool thing let's let's get involved um yeah so yeah i understand yeah we need to talk more about that but so i i want to go back to um so, so you had this experience that I know it's not an easy thing to talk about because not, not a lot of people can understand your, your unique multiple perspectives from, from the both sides of adoption, which is very, very unique. But um, so the memoir, were you always a writer? Were you always a bookish person? Was that a thing that you said, this is a story or did, did the, like, did the book come out of a left of center or how did that happen? 
No, I had, I had always been a writer. I mean, like I've probably everybody listening to this podcast, you know, I wrote my first story in the fourth grade and, okay. and I still remember it. Um, and then I went to school and I got my MFA in writing. Um, but I still hadn't, I, I would write things like I would write these really long, you know, funny anecdotes on Facebook. And I was putting all this energy into writing, but I wasn't creating a tangible thing. And I had never felt just maniacally driven to do so, like lock myself in a room, you know, don't eat for five hours or more until we adopted Henry. And it just kind of all meshed with my own adoption. And then it was kind of a, it, that, that was the first time in my life I felt that drive that writers talk about where I had to write it. I had to. So I said, I'm curious about that too, because it's such a person, you're sharing such intimate personal things. You're writing this book to help other people not feel alone. It sounds to me like that's like, they're like, right? Yes. Wow. Yes. The, the first, the first impetus was like, I just learned so much adoption about adoption. Right. And my husband and I actually did it really well. Like we were chosen in six months and that's, really quick in the adoption world. And, and I want to help other, um, you know, hopeful adoptive parents. I want to help because it was so hard and I learned so much. And, and when I was looking for memoirs, of course, that's what I would research when, you know, we were starting the process. And really the only one I found that was even remotely helpful was um, The Mothers by, by Jennifer Gilmore. And it, it um, actually- Oh, it's a about, novel. It is, oh, but it, she talks about it as it being um, pretty autobiographical. But she oh, okay, did so it's a novel. novel inspired by, okay, okay, interesting, yeah. okay. Yeah, but she talked, I mean, she spoke about it like I do um, in terms of what birth moms are really like and what their circumstances are really like. Um, but that was the only one that I found. The other ones that I found were all, and now I'm going to sound like my own query letter, but um, they were all like really rainbows and unicorns and, um, you know, fluffy blankets. And that is not, no, it's prostitutes and battered women and drugs and heroin, you know, so that's, that's what really inspired me to write it. And then I didn't even know the second part was going to come out because when I started writing matched, I hadn't searched for my birth mom yet. Oh, that's right. Because Henry. So was it was all happening. Up. Yeah. Real time. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so I have to ask this question since you knew the birth mother uh, and before uh, giving birth to Henry, uh, was there discussion amongst the, the, I guess, the three of you for a name or was it your, you and your husband? Or how did that work? I have to ask. I'm curious. No, we actually didn't know her. This, Henry's adoption was one of the super rare ones where oh, okay. we, we got a call from the hospital. She chose us from the hospital, um, but we oh, wait, were, so she, is, she had had the baby and found out about you and, and was like, oh, these guys look pretty cool. Okay. Yes. She <laughs> okay. was like, okay. Yeah. She literally read the Dear Birth Mom letters. That's what they're called. She read like, dear birth read mom them letters. from her bed. Not like a Dear John letter, which is not a good, okay. Right. Yeah. Totally <laughs> different thing. Um, and yeah. And so we just flew in the morning he was born um, after, you know, after he'd been born. From, how far away was it? uh northern from southern california to northern california that's a, it's a long long uh narrow state yeah <laughs> okay. yeah short flight yeah um and no we had a name for him um we wanted to name him after pete's grandfather but we were open to if she had a name you know we were open to that too maybe using it as a middle name or just we were just open to whatever she said okay. but uh, i was i was hoping that she wouldn't have a name because I was still a little insecure right and I just I I just wasn't sure I was being selfish I wasn't sure about her having an imprint on him you know um and now I would all none of that matters now I, I see that but um when we walked in she just kind of apologetically said you know I haven't been able to come up with a name for him I'm sorry and wow. and it was it was either a very gracious way yeah of allowing us to name henry or maybe she really hadn't it was her way of not maybe not connecting too much 
but yeah, that was it. It was really beautiful. Wow. See, I, I learned that I was called baby Edward, uh, named after my birth father. Oh. Uh, and I didn't learn that till I think I was 28 or 29. And I was like, oh, Edward, that was, that was the name I had for the first six months of my life before I was adopted. Right? Yes. <laughs> so it was, like, it was one of those things. I like, no, but I'm Mark. But I mean, so the very first novel I wrote, the main character's name was Edward. Of course. <laughs> <So it's> like, <laughs> It's just like, cause it's kind of like, it's like, there's like, well, that's kind of part of my identity, sort of, at least. <laughs> yes. My, my birth mom, Gwen, told me that she had named me um, Christine, was it Christine Ann? Okay. In the hospital. And they had told her, this is very seventies, that they'd put that on the birth certificate. Of course they did not. No. And then I went to foster care for six months and I was baby Lynn there. Okay, so you've had and multiple so identities. I'm with you on the multiple identities thing. It's crazy. <laughs> That's fascinating. Wow. Um, okay, so let's, you've written this memoir. Let's we'll get back to the writer talk. It's back like you and I just having a bond writing. over over the adoption. Um, uh, we'll get to the memoir. So you've written the memoir, uh, and uh, you've got an MFA in creative writing. Obviously, you've written tons of articles, stories, etc. Uh, yeah. So that's always been in your blood and your path. You, you decided you were going to get this uh, to a traditional publisher. So can yeah. you talk about what was that? What was that process like? And how was it different from the writing? <laughs> <laughs> he sets her up for this. <laughs> this if you thought the prostitutes and everything was tough. <laughs> well, well, the funny thing is, is how much I celebrated you know, I had a dinner, I think my husband and I went out to dinner when my book was done. When you and finished I'm doing it, air yeah. Quote. yeah. It was finished, right? Yeah. And then somebody, you know, or maybe I checked out a book. I mean, I was such a noob. I, and then the, um, the words book proposal came into my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they would haunt you forever. <laughs> so offended. I was like, what? Somebody just doesn't want to like, swoop in and buy this golden baby that I just produced you know it's they don't just trust that it's it's really good and my voice is really strong no okay so then I spent another year oh maybe it was maybe it was five months on the book proposal I just checked out a book um or no I think I bought it oh what was it yeah here we go okay I, this is my bible you guys how to Write a Book Proposal by Michael Larson. And I just... <laughs> I'm checking to see if I have that one on my shelf. <laughs> okay, cool. How to Write a and Book I Proposal. I just followed it. I mean, verbatim. Like somebody had assigned it and I was going to get an A+. Plus. And I just followed it. And then I guess after that came the query process. And I mm -hmm. bought... Um, Jane Friedman's book on how to write a query and one of the then best I spent another <laughs> several months on that yeah and the smartest thing I ever did I don't know if she's still offering this service is I hired Jane to critique and help me with my query after I'd I'd done blood sweat and tears on it I thought it was perfect then I hired her right. which is really the way to do it yeah um yeah. And then, so, I mean, after my book was done, it was really, really a wake up call that I wasn't anywhere near done. Spent probably nine months on, on that altogether. And then I started querying. Cool. So let's go back to, so for writers who are, are not, so my audience is um, potentially indie authors, uh, traditionally published authors, authors who are thinking of where to go, what to do. Yeah. So for any author who does not know what, what is, Denise, what is a book proposal? What is it? Oh my <laughs> is, it is it you get down on one knee and you say, will you marry me, publisher? Or is that? Is that <laughs> <laughs> yes, base, kind of, yeah. Um, basically, a book proposal is, and Mark, you can correct me on this, but it's a document that is going to be seen by an editor. And it's usually about, I think you could say the average is around 35, 40 pages. And it is an introduction to your book. Um, man, it's a, it has at least two sample chapters in it. Okay. It has a complete marketing plan. It has a section for 
um, comparable books so that they can know, they can see like, okay, we can imagine placing it in this market. And is this, you know, how well do books on adoption sell? And it's just, it's very the business side of what we do. It's, it's, here's my book. Here's why it'll sell. Here's why you should buy it. Here's a sample of my writing. Please buy my book. Okay. So yeah. uh, that, that leads to thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what a, a proposal package is, at least from what I've learned. So you talked about uh, comparable books or what in, in the industry side, on the book side of things, there's a, what, comp titles. What, what are the yes. comps? So you mentioned that you found that, that novel. I remember trying to understand more about adoption. And I remember reading, I think it was called The Journey of the Adopted Self. And I read that book and it, and it was, it was this really depressing story about how I'm supposed to be so screwed up oh, yeah. because of, because I was adopted and I'm supposed to have all of these issues. And I felt when I read the book, I felt like, oh, now I don't fit in. Uh, Cause I, you know, I don't, I don't hate my yes. birth mother for giving me away and I don't you know feel abandoned all the time. Although I do have a thing with women rejecting me and I keep joking with my fiance that you know that's you know women leave me it's like it's like does that come from my being adopted because i was given up like it's like come on get over yourself anyways yeah. uh I, I felt weird when i finished it because i felt well i'm not screwed up like everyone that they talk about in this book and yes. so i just, i would like to read i want to read a realistic story but not a completely always maybe because I'm an optimist and, and I always look at the bright side. So it's kind of like there is love involved in adoption, isn't there? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Same Mark. When we, when we went to the classes, um, the parenting classes before adopting Henry, the agency that we went to for these required classes framed up adoption. I mean, they had big PowerPoints and it there's an adoption wheel. That's very famous. As I had never seen it before, but it's very famous within the adoption educator world. Right. And right in the middle of it is like shame, depression. And I was like, I, I don't. And, and then, but then it, it becomes a thing where <laughs> other than you and I can talk this language right now because we're both adopted. But if you say that too much to anybody, they're like, well, you know, she's probably in denial. <laughs> I'm like, no, really, I don't. <laughs> Just covering it up. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so I I share that experience with you absolutely. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, so um, uh, I've read some articles. Speaking of Jane Friedman, I think there was an article on uh, Jane Friedman's website, um, or it was me. I can't remember because a number of articles, and they were about not giving up, which I know applies for writers and it applies for querying and submissions to agents and editors. Also, it applies for obviously when you're looking to to bring a, a loved a young one into your life that you want yes. to love. Um, yes. But then there was also uh, you even talked about uh, querying during the pandemic. I'm really curious to to like what has your experience been and and um, I guess what's the experience been? What's the struggle been like? And how have you kept yourself going? Um, well, I actually queried in 2019 and got my agent in 2019. I went on submission during the pandemic so, oh, so your agent was one, putting the stuff out on submission uh okay so let's let's go back to the agent parts like how long did it part, take yeah. to get the agent then um it took well in the article that you read um explains it but i'll just really shorthand it here for for um Listen, your listeners man. basically it took me uh, eight months about to find an agent, but like any parent writer out there, this will ring true. Um, it took me eight months because there were massive gaps in my time that I could commit to querying. Mm -hmm. I queried like crazy. I would query, I would send out about some, some weeks I'd send out five queries. Some weeks I'd send out 10 queries. Um, I was, I'm not a fast query person because I really do my research because I, I think it was Jane's book as well that taught me how important that is that, you know, know why you're querying someone. So it's yes. going to be very clear to them. They're going to know whether you know why you're querying them or not. So anyway, I did that. And then in the middle, my son had some like anxiety and depression issues. So all of that stopped. I didn't have an agent. It was like, I'd been into it for five months and 
I'd had some heady interest like from MMQ, my like one of my first weeks, they sent back and they asked me for my full manuscript, which basically for, when people start querying anybody listening, they'll either come back and say, no, thank you. No, no, actually the first thing is they'll never come back and say anything. They'll ghost you. <laughs> <laughs> ghost the shit out of you. And that just um, takes well, me right back to when being abandoned at birth. Right, <laughs> um, Mark, maybe we do have issues. Um, and then, or they'll come back and say, we'd like to see the first 10 pages, right. um, which is what MMQ did. And then they came back, it was insane. And they said, well, okay, send us the next 10, send us the next 10. But more than they'll, what and um, a publisher will usually say is send us, you know, two chapters or send us after they read your first two chapters, then they might say, send us your full manuscript. Okay. And that is thrilling like nothing else. Right. So all that happened right away to me. So I got this injection of confidence. Right. But then they passed. Oh. Um, and then nothing for like three or four months. Um, maybe, you know, maybe a couple chapter requests, but it really felt like nothing. Right. And then, but one of the agents that had requested a full, or maybe, maybe it was just a half during the summer, she never came back and said no afterwards, which normally they will. If, if they've read your manuscript, they'll at least have the courtesy of coming back and say, hey, it's actually not for us. Best of luck, blah, blah, blah. Right. But she never did. And so what I did was I pinged her again in the fall. And I remember telling like Julie and my husband at the time, like, this is so stupid. Like if she was interested, she would have responded. But since on my big querying spreadsheet, which everybody should create a querying spreadsheet, she was still yellow, which meant I don't know yet. I haven't heard back. So I just kept holding on to that hope. And then um, I kept sending queries. I think I sent 80 total. And my agent ended up being query number 31. And she finally responded ah. back in the fall. And she's like, oh no, yeah, I love it. Let's, let's talk on the phone. And I'd talked oh. to another agent on the phone the week before, but when they want to, I'd read in a book or somebody told me when they want to talk on the phone, they're going to offer representation. Like they're not going to talk to you just to get to know you. And so I was- They don't know, have time. <laughs> they don't, right. Yeah. You know, so I, I mean, maybe this is TMI, but I had total nervous diarrhea before I talked to her on the phone. <laughs> See, you and I have very similar that we, we share way too much. <laughs> And then, you know, and then she offered representation and I was thrilled because it had taken 80 queries and, wow. and it had been very hard to keep going when, you know, I wasn't hearing back. Yeah. And then actually just before my agent um, offered, another agent offered the week before, which to anybody listening who doesn't have an agent sounds like the best thing in the world and unbelievable and that'll never happen to me, but it will. Yeah. And the other agent was like, well, I've read your manuscript and and then she had a bulleted list, I'm not shitting you, of like 17 issues that she had with my manuscript. And then she had signed it at the bottom. What are you gonna do about it? Um, but let's talk next week. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> and I was like, but I hadn't talked to my agent that loved me yet. So I was like, well, this is kind of a shit sandwich, but it's an agent. Yeah, what I'm gonna and do I'm, about it is I'm gonna wait till after I talk to the <laughs> agent that's not gonna crap all over my manuscript. I was able to do that. I was able to do that. And then I was able, and I joke about this in my article, um, but it was the best email I ever have sent in my life to tell the other agent, thank you so much for your input. <laughs> but oh, no, I've actually signed, them. yes. Is it, but you're not right for us at this time or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, you're not right for my totally manuscript at this time. I mean, I'm sure you're going to be right for someone else. <laughs> yeah, it's not you. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> I have another agent. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Uh, are you are you okay with talking about the um, uh, the the title change that your agent is currently considering? Yeah, I mean, it's actually I want to be totally honest about all aspects of publishing because it's so hard and it's so yeah. easy to lose any confidence that you're able to give yourself as a, um, as a writer, but matched went on, uh, submission. And then you're going to have to just pause for a moment for everybody to laugh, Mark, 
March 13th, 2020. That was, um, okay. So the day the world shut <laughs> it down. It was the day the world locked down, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. And my agent and I talked and, you know, I was like, I don't know, should we just do it? Of course I wanted to do it because I was, I had been waiting my whole life for, right. to say my book is on submission. Are you kidding me? Yeah. But um, I also didn't want to send it out at the wrong time and then, you know, have my baby not get picked up because of, you know, timing. Or at least that's what I would always tell myself. And I didn't want to do that falsely either. So we just decided to go for it. She's like, I can tell you that they're still reading. They might be for reading from home, but they're still reading. Yep. Um, and we got back tons of good feedback. Um, and a couple of agents who said, you know, I actually um, went to battle for it in, you know, the weekly meeting at the round table. I went to battle for her, but, um, you know, it just didn't get picked up or marketing doesn't think we can sell it, blah, blah, blah. Um, one agent came back and said uh, he found some of my, <clears throat> my voice. Um, he was the only person to say this, but um, a little too hardcore and um you know where i was trying for raw and real sometimes was offensive so we talked about changing that but ultimately we didn't because the other feedback was like fucking love her voice right you know right. so it's hard it's hard you have to go with your gut and you have to have an agent that believes in you um but yeah so ultimately what so it did not get picked up she submitted it to just about everybody that we could think of and then um she said and then I ended up caring from, again, women of my age, writers, you're with me. I ended up having to stop submitting because I couldn't keep up print, having articles published, which is a big part of submission so that you stay current. They see that like, oh yeah, okay, she's legit. Other people are publishing her. Maybe we can publish her too. Right. I had to take care of my mother who, you know, as I spoke of, I love so much and she moved in with us and she had cancer and then passed away six months later so all my writing stopped during that time um and then now my agent and i are talking again about submission and she's like here's what we're gonna do and this is such an insider thing like i i don't even know if i should say this but she said here's what we're gonna do we're gonna change the title and publishing is so incestuous and people are leaving and going and there's new editors here and this editor went over to this imprint she's like we're gonna send it out to everybody again because ain't nobody who saw it last summer in the same position. And we're just gonna, you know, see where the chips fall. So that's what we're doing. And and I was a little bit protective of my title because matched is such a wink to anybody in the adoption world. Right. Babies are matched with parents. It's a very big word in adoption. However, I don't know that I'd pick up a book called Matched. Right. And so we're workshopping other titles that tell you a little bit more what it's about. Like I'm thinking of maybe, um, I haven't even run this by my agent yet, but like birth moms. You can listen to it on this podcast. Yeah. She, <laughs> hi, Jackie. <laughs> um, birth moms aren't saints and I'm no savior. You know, one birth, one adoptive mom's experience and no open adoption or something. Right. Something that tells you really what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very uh, keyword esque. So that is so, so very people SEO. Looking for, yeah. 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 I like that. Um, so I, I'm so glad you shared that insight. And I do know, for example, uh, even a, a former guest, uh, an author friend of mine, who uh, ended up self publishing uh, a great novel, and then got picked up by a major publisher. And because they wanted to market her as a debut author, they gave her a middle initial. So it could be the first book by this author. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got publishing does stuff like that. So it's just it's just part of the so yes, that that name is a debut author. Yes, yeah, <laughs> tricks of the trade, you know, right? Stephen H. King has never written a book in his life. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love it. But that is uh, that is fantastic. I'm so excited about that. So um, thank you so much for sharing so many personal insights as well as the the business because I know there's writers out there that are going to go, oh, okay, thank you for explaining that. I don't, you know, so so I appreciate that. Where? Where can my listeners find out more all about you? Well, I would love them to go to my website, which is denisemaster.org. And um, my last name is spelled M-A-S-S-A-R. 
And then um, I write things and post them on Medium. And I'm just Denise Masser on Medium. Okay. And I'm trying to get into Twitter. Oh, my God. If anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, please. Well, so read your, what's your Twitter handle? I'll follow uh, it's you Denise immediately. Denise Masser. At Denise Masser. You made it hard. Well, okay. I've, <laughs> I've, I tried to keep everything Denise Masser. So you can find me anywhere. And then... Um, also, I have an author page on Facebook where I um, throw up some live book reviews once in a while and some other articles. And I'm just Denise Masser on Facebook also. Awesome. Denise, thank you so much. This has been such a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Mark. This was so fun. I'm so happy we did this. So many cool things to reflect on in this interview with uh, Denise. Uh, first of all, just it's it's really amazing when you meet someone in the minute. It was the first time Denise and I had ever spoken, and and we just clicked immediately. And obviously had so much in common, so many unique perspectives to share. And and I remember finishing uh, the conversation with Denise and I. I had to run immediately to another meeting, but just as the other meeting was kind of booting up in the Zoom window. I was texting Julie to say, oh my God, I just finished a conversation with Denise. She is amazing. I can see why you're besties. And uh, I, I love I love when that happens, when you, you know, you, you realize. I mean, you know, as, as an adopted person, I don't have that in common with a lot of people that I know in my life. And then also even the experience of having um, met my birth family and, and having sort of similar feelings uh, that Denise has. So that that's kind of, that, that's something I wanted to reflect on, but that's more of a personal thing. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the submission process and business of publishing. And there was a phrase that she used that I wanted to kind of uh, focus in on. And it was uh, when she talked about an uh, editor at a publishing house that went to battle at the round table. And, and what she's referring to there is the detail that in publishing especially with the mergers you have imprints from publishers that have limited spots for uh, titles within uh, particular catalogs or imprints or, or brands or whatever and you may have let's say a dozen editors that all have six or seven titles that they want to bring to the table so let's say you have just for ease of math 10 editors and they each bring six titles to the table so there's, you know, 60, between 60 and 100, uh, 6 to 10 titles. And uh, there's between 60 and 100 uh, titles on the table uh, for, for debate. But they only have room to publish about 30 or 40 of them. So what happens is each of the editors then, you know, pitches them. And there's probably some marketing people in the room or bean counters or executives who are looking at the logistics. And you will get at a table like that. Uh, someone that will say, oh, you know, we, we, we already have a title in this area. We already have a memoir. We can't do another memoir. Um, or, you know, celebrity memoirs obviously uh, usually trump regular memoirs because, you know, they know they're going to make a crap ton of money off of this ridiculous, idiotic, uh, snooky memoir or whatever bullshit that they publish. Anyways, uh, but they, they have to do that because it helps them make money uh, as opposed to an authentic memoir from a real person like Denise. <laughs> That's just me being critical of, of, of big publishers. But these are the kinds of things that happen because I, I had a friend and I may have mentioned this in a recent episode. My apologies if I did, but uh, Lawrence Hill, uh, who's, uh, you know, an esteemed, uh, you know, best-selling, uh, respected, literary award-winning author here in Canada. And I, and I knew Larry when he was the writer-in-residence at McMaster University when I was at the bookstore. And I had the espresso book machine and Larry said, oh my God, I just edited a book of a friend of mine. She wrote this memoir and, um, and she's had, hasn't had uh, luck getting it published. And he introduced me to Alicia Snell and, and it was her memoir, me minus 173. And it, and it was her memoir of losing 173 pounds at the age of 40. And then by the time she was 45, she ran the Boston Marathon. She was on Oprah. She already had this, like, she had already been on Oprah. Oprah flew her out to talk about what she had done. And all she did was at the age of 40, she started to follow Canada's food guide. And then she started walking that turned into running. And then, you know, within a few years, she was running in the Boston Marathon, like a pretty dramatic thing. So anyways, uh, Larry introduced me to Alicia and, and, and I helped her create this book uh, on the espresso book machine when I was at Mac, which is basically allows you to print and bind a, a book right there on the spot. So she was a motivational speaker and a coach. And, and this is just a book that she had available um, that she was selling uh, directly. And so 
when I read it, I was like, oh my god, this is a fan. Because, you know, Larry <laughs> loved it and he helped edit it. So I, you had to know it was good. And and then Alicia, uh, when I asked her, I said, well, oh my god, this is such a great book. How, why didn't a publisher pick it up? And she had said it had been through the rounds at multiple large publishers. And some of the time, the publishers would go, oh, it's a great book, but uh, oh, we just published a diet book this year. And, and they only had room for one diet book, is what they called it. Or we just published one memoir this year. And so uh, this happens all the time at major publishers, where it's a great book, the editor pitches it, everyone loves it, and they want to put it on the chopping block, or they want to put it on the board to be published, but then someone goes, oh yeah, but we already have a book something like that. And, and that's the challenge of the amalgamation of all of the publishing houses, because when I started in the book industry, they're the, the big 12 publishers, not the big four or five as they are today. And so a lot of those imprints were separate. And so they both, they would have actually, you know, they, instead of amalgamating, they would have had room for it and those books would have appeared. So that's an interesting thing. So when you, when you hear her talk about uh, bringing it to the table, that is exactly what uh, editors do. Uh, at publishing houses, they they take on these pet projects. They really pitch. They they go to the they go to bat for the writer, and sometimes the bean counters or whatever it is basically say, "Eh, can't do that. We have a book like that or a similar theme or whatever." Or yeah, you know, there's all kinds of other factors. The other thing that's really important to to acknowledge is that, and I've done this as an editor as as I've been uh, reading submissions for anthologies is, and oftentimes I'm reading short stories for inclusion in an anthology. Sometimes I'm just tired when I go to read the story and, and it just doesn't sit right with me and I can't, I can't even read it. And I've, I've done that a few times where a story that I couldn't read and I thought was horrible, I put aside and I pick up on a different day. And for some reason, on the other day, the story I couldn't even get into because I thought it was horrible was one of the best stories that I read. And all of these factors are always at play when you're looking at submissions is you might have hit the right editor on the wrong day. <laughs> and and there's nothing you can do about that other than not giving up, other than keep trying. Uh, the other thing Denise talked about renaming uh, the memoir, well, renaming the memoir, you know, potentially uh, to, to take advantage of, of, of trends in the industry that, you know, the agent is very cognizant of and very, very uh, adept and aware of which is brilliant. Um, I'm glad she has such a great agent. But um, just knowing that, okay, so the title matched may make sense uh, to someone already in the position, but even for myself, when I when I saw the title matched, well, well, Liz and I met on match.com. So when I think about matched, I, I'm thinking about uh, love rather than, well, different kind of love, adoption. Um, although now that you mention it, yeah, matched makes sense that you've been matched, uh, the parents and the child. But no, potentially the the title change is probably uh, potentially going to resonate with the uh, with the uh, the marketing people uh, that an editor has to has to contend with, right? Like, how are people gonna when they see the title? How are they gonna know what this book is about? So, there's so many of these underlying business factors at play when you're in traditional publishing. Now, if you're in indie publishing or you're self publishing, a lot of those things are still at play because they're you know again you're 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 in an online catalog. The slush pile has moved from the back room of a publisher to an online catalog near you. And, and the same challenge is there is how is the title, how is the cover, how is that synopsis uh, of the book, how is that going to draw the right readers in? So there's so many of these other underlying factors that are always at play. But I love the fact that Denise shared some of the intricacies of the book proposal and working with her agent and all of that. And I love the fact that neither her nor her agent have given up. And I look forward to hearing the news when, uh, when the right publisher uh, makes the right decision and actually puts in an offer uh, for this book, because I'm really looking forward to being one of the first people to buy it when it comes out. Well, that's it for uh, the reflection for this episode. That's it for episode 188. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this podcast, I would really appreciate if you took the time to leave a review for the podcast on the podcatcher of your choice. Other ways you can support the podcast, you can support the podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections, where for as little as $1, $3, or $5 a month, you can get access to additional bonus content, including my reflections on other podcasts, as well as additional content, audio and video content. You can also, if you like, share this podcast with a friend that you think would find great value in it. But again, this is the end of episode 188. And so 
Until next week and next episode, this is Mark Leslie LeFave wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.